The Night Beat starts right now. The hope is to get ahead of the 4th of July holiday. The city and county closing parks in hopes of bringing down the surge in coronavirus cases here at home. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf saying he does not want a repeat of what happened on Memorial Day. He announced the park closures will happen Friday through Sunday. Uh, we know the good part of what we did back in Easter when we closed. Nothing closed on Memorial Day, so we want to take the extra precaution of closing the parks on the July the 4th. Bear County saw hundreds of COVID-19 cases added today for a new total of 12,504. The death toll has increased by one tonight for a total of 111. The number of recoveries has increased to more than 4,800, but there are still 7,500 people fighting the illness. And for the first time, the number of people in the hospital has crossed the 1,000 mark, with 324 people in the intensive care unit and 175 people on ventilators. In less than 24 hours, a change in emergency orders issued by San, for San Antonio businesses, rather. Temperature checks originally required for both employees and customers, but local leaders have now changed that requirement. The night team, Stephen Gavasso, speaks with one local business owner who still plans to take the extra precautions. Like we found a good a good solution here that works uh, that accomplishes the objective but also doesn't create any secondary consequences. More changes for local businesses. Today Mayor Ron Nirenberg announced that businesses will be required to post a list of COVID-19 symptoms near their entrance to encourage customers to stay home if they're ill. The mayor says symptom checking is critical when it comes to reducing the spread of COVID-19. That's the whole point of this is to make sure that we screen people before we're putting others in harm's way. Yesterday, Bear County and city leaders said temperature checks would be a requirement. Now it's highly encouraged where it's practical. But businesses like theme parks that have gatherings of over 100 people are still required to do temperature checks. The mayor says most places have protocols in place, but in the event that they don't, we are requiring that they do. Federico Guillen is the owner of Sabor Cocina located off McCullough. Guillen says public health is his top priority, but adds it's been a challenge. We've been struggling and uh, kind of adjusted to all the changes. He says numbers have dwindled in the restaurant, but he will still ask customers and employees to stay away if they are sick. And although temperature screenings won't be a requirement for smaller businesses, it's something he still plans to do. We're still going to do it, yes, starting tomorrow morning, because I think it's for the safety of uh, customers and employees as well. Stephen Cavasso's KSAT 12 News. And while hospitals are worried about being overwhelmed by a rise in cases, so is the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office. The morgue experiencing multiple deaths outside of the hospital setting so at home, as well as those who don't even know they were infected with COVID-19. Those are the words from Dr. Kimberly Molina, who was just named Bear County Medical Examiner. She says the increase in caseload means a need for more storage space. Our footprint in our building is a fixed footprint. And so very early on, we also identified that we might need more space, unfortunately, for more decedents. Dr. Molina says they were able to get some funding for extra coolers to be built in that facility. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf says commissioners are exploring long term plans for the use of space. Well, it works and it saves lives. Tonight, we're hearing from a man who received remdesivir when he contracted COVID-19. He was part of the University Health System study, which is now considered the largest in the world. The night team's Tiffany Huertas also spoke to doctors who say the antiviral drug is showing promising results. I went from feeling fine to feeling extremely fatigued. 29-year-old Kevin Lindsay believes he contracted COVID-19 in late May. Kevin says his symptoms began on May 31st and was hospitalized that night. He was at University Hospital for six days. About two days in, uh, they let me know about the study. Um, I was, I can't lie, I was pretty desperate to take anything that would shorten the COVID process because it was horrible. Kevin agreed to be part of the University Health System and UT Health Remdesivir clinical trial. Maybe like two days after they started giving me the Remdesivir, everything started clearing up. 
Dr. Brian Alsip, Chief Medical Officer at University Health System, says from the data he's seen globally, it's proven to be a very effective tool treating COVID-19 patients. It really shortened the duration of a hospitalization stay. It, was, uh, it allowed patients to get discharged earlier. Dr. Thomas Patterson is leading the clinical trial for remdesivir at University Health System. We at, uh, here at University Hospital have enrolled almost 100 patients. Uh, and the reason I think is pretty clear because we're having a surge of infections here in San Antonio. Just be conscious, you know, don't sneeze, cough on people, wash your hands, think about your families. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Dr. Brian Alsip with University Hospital says other local hospitals have received remdesivir and they are also sharing among each other when there is a need. COVID-19 creating a multi-million dollar setback for UTSA. That's now leading to hundreds of layoffs for the university. More than 2,000 staff are employed with UTSA. University President Taylor Amy announced 243 positions will be eliminated. 67 of those are classified under skilled labor positions. The 176 others are in management, administrative, and other professional positions. Student employment will be continued to be handled on a department by department basis. One student we spoke to says she's anxious ahead of the fall semester. I am a little bit nervous if I will still have my on campus job. Also like is a, bit, a little concern of mine if I'll be able to work um, and keep my job and pay rent. The layoffs come after a $35.8 million shortfall for the next fiscal year. UTSA officials say affected staff will continue to be compensated by UTSA through the end of August. The university plans to begin its fall semester as scheduled on August 24th, then move to virtual formats after the Thanksgiving break. Shots fired on the city's south side. New on the night beat one man killed, another hurt in today's shooting. Police are now searching for those involved. Police say one man was hit in the chest and the other somewhere in the abdomen just after 6 o'clock this evening near Ripford and Knox. That's not too far from Highway 90 and I-35. Officers believe someone came to the home where the two victims were shot after an argument over money. Well, school board member wanted tonight. The Wilson County Sheriff's Office is trying to track down Floresville ISD board <coughs> member Alina Berlanga. The Sheriff's Office is accusing her and two others of stealing a pregnant donkey last month. The baby donkey did not survive. We reached out to Floresville ISD and Berlanga but have not received a response. The Sheriff's Office says the two other suspects, Nicole Sullivan and Pamela Johnson, are working on arrangements to turn themselves in. The local Christopher Columbus statue now removed temporarily for repairs. That's the official explanation. City Council still needs to vote on its permanent removal in August. The statue would then be given back to the Christopher Columbus Italian Society, who's recognized the symbol's controversial meaning. There are talks about replacing the Columbus statue with the family of Italian immigrants to better represent the Italian community. District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino, who originally requested the removal, has asked that the entire park be renamed Piazza Italia. Muggy out there tonight and temperatures tomorrow morning are going to be mostly in the mid and upper 70s will be about 80 degrees Del Rio and Corpus Christi. We're forecasting about 78 for the morning low here in San Antonio by the afternoon. Well, more typical early July heat 97 here in town, but at and above 100 south and west of San Antonio. And it's the type of day that's likely to stress our power grid. So CPS, they definitely suggest lowering your energy use during the peak hours between 3 and 6 p.m. We'll have more on the forecast, including our next rain chance and lake levels coming right up. Thank you, Adam. The latest now in the case of Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen missing since late April. A fellow soldier died by suicide and a civilian is under arrest after remains that are believed to be hers were found. Guillen's family saying they want justice. A dramatic twist in the case of missing Fort Hood soldier Vanessa Guillen. A day after human remains were found in a shallow grave near the Army base Tuesday, police say a suspect in her disappearance, a junior soldier, fled the post, then died by suicide when police found him. Another civilian suspect is under arrest. The Army has not confirmed the identity of the remains, but Vanessa's family believes they are hers. We believe that her remains were found. My sister did not deserve to suffer. My sister did not deserve this. 
The 20 year old was last seen more than two months ago at the parking lot of the base's headquarters. Where is Vanessa? The disappearance of the private first class setting off rallies in Fort Hood, protesters calling for answers. Her family says before she disappeared, she claimed a superior sexually harassed her, but did not report him out of fear. Now the Army is investigating alongside the FBI, saying they've interviewed more than 150 people. Guillen's family says it needs to go further with a congressional investigation. And I want justice and I want answers. The civilian suspect has ties to the Army as well. She is the estranged wife of a former Fort Hood soldier. She is in custody and has not been charged. It's still ahead on the night beat a rise in bike sales happening amid this pandemic. How local bike shop owners are hoping to keep up with supply and demand. And changes are happening as we head into the 4th of July weekend. Tonight, a live conversation with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg coming up in our KSAT Q&A. And protesters taking to San Antonio streets today. A look with Sky 12 and how others in the nation are responding to a call for change. It's next on the night. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. The demand for change continues tonight. Protests seen just west of downtown along South San Marcos this evening. The group continues to call for an end to racism and justice for George Floyd. You can see a line of cars as well as people marching. Protesters have vowed to keep protesting until a change is made. In Mississippi, the state flag will no longer bear the image of the Confederate battle flag. They were the last holdout at 3 p.m. today as you're watching it. The flag was lowered from the state capitol and presented to the state's Department of Archives and History. This after Mississippi's governor signed a bill to remove the flag. A new design expected after the November elections. Though the Confederate battle flag is no longer part of any state flag, some southern states retain imagery containing other Confederate symbols. The White House now responding to allegations of bounties placed on U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Reports accused Russia of paying the Taliban for the hits. President Donald Trump calling it a hoax, while White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany insists the intel was never passed along to the president and then described the alleged intel as unverified. A local official tells ABC News the information first came to light from special operations raids. The official says raids on Taliban strongholds last January uncovered large amounts of American cash. The Times now reporting officials intercepted electronic data showing large financial transfers from a bank account controlled by Russia's military intelligence agency, the GRU, and was sent to a Taliban linked account. And President Donald Trump set to meet with Mexico's president next week in Washington, D.C. The two are scheduled to discuss a variety of issues on July 8th. On the 9th, then, representatives from Canada will join the meeting, marking the start of the USMCA, which is the new free trade deal replacing NAFTA. That agreement goes into effect today. This will be the first time Presidents Trump and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador will meet in person. It's also the first time that Lopez Obrador will leave Mexico since taking office in 2018. The meeting comes as Mexico and the U.S. deal with the rise in coronavirus cases. As the pandemic continues, bike sales are on the rise, meaning a shortage if you're in the market for a new one or looking for parts. According to the NPD Group, which tracks global sports and recreational markets, U.S. April sales on bikes, helmets and other parts grew to $1 billion in one month, a 75% increase compared to last year. The night team's Patty Santos tells us local bike shop owners hope the supply and demand will catch up later this summer. April and May were my two best consecutive months that I've ever had. It's a bike shop owner's dream. Bicycling interests soaring as more people seek leisure, exercise, and for others, safer transportation. We're just kind of waiting for the 2021s to come out because everything that uh, that was produced for 2020 is it's gone. Clay Williams, owner of San Antonio Bike Shop, says the pandemic caused production delays in China as demand increased globally. His sales have gone up 80 to 100 percent since the end of March. I don't think the supply chain was ready to handle the amount of people 
globally trying to get back on bikes um, during the pandemic. Brian Martin with Broncos Bikes LLC says even his electric bike kits are in high demand. Honestly, the month of May, uh, in this fiscal period, we're seeing like almost double to quadruple the amount of sales that we usually see in the month of May, which is May is usually one of the biggest um, uh, months for, for purchasing bikes. But the backlog isn't just about the bikes. It's also for the parts. I haven't been able to buy 26 inch tubes for the last uh, three weeks, and it looks like they're not going to be in until maybe the first of August. Shop owners hope production catches up later this summer, but that the cycling interest doesn't fade, although there are still options. The good news is, is there's plenty of used bikes out there. You just have to do a little digging and find out what you're looking for. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. I've been meaning to go look for a bike, but I guess I will wait. You could find a used yeah, one out true. there, maybe. That's true. Yeah. You want to put in the time to yeah. do your searches, for sure. I probably have some in my garage. I was going to say, oh, <laughs> depending on, you yeah. know, how, what size you want. You yeah, go. with three kids as they grow oh, up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I counted seven in the garage. Oh, my I, goodness. I think I probably have seven in my garage, yeah. too, now, wow. right now. Yeah. I have a tricycle. Yeah. That's about it. But yeah. I'm it's something. Good. Maybe you guys can hook me up. <laughs> well, yeah, we have been uh, passing them down the line to other folks. That, that's just uh, how it goes. And it's that time of year where, hey, it's July and it's sticky, it's hot, it's sweaty outside. And every once in a while, we get some revenant showers and thunderstorms. That's going on right now in parts of the northern hill country. We'll get into that in a moment. First, let's take a look at area lake reservoir levels. And let's start off with Medina Lake. That'll be the first one that pops up on the list. And I do want to point out, I did see an article on KSAT.com today that the County Park and the county's public boat launch is planning on being closed for the 4th of July weekend. I don't know the exact times and dates, but go to our website, kset.com, for the details. Nonetheless, 64% full, that's 17 feet below the conservation pool. Canyon, as usual, doing pretty well. Uh, one foot below the conservation pool. Choke. 19 feet below, that's 42% capacity in Buchanan, uh, just about 100% capacity, so looking good. Here's a look at the radar and earlier today at five and six, I was talking about that activity flaring up near San Angelo saying, hey, if we're really lucky, we can get some of it in the Edwards Plateau, Northern Hill Country. Well, we're starting to see that creep in. This became very electrified here in Sutton County, Sonora area, some very heavy rainfall, good soaking rain, nothing severe associated with this right now. And indications would be that over the next hour and a half or so, this would really fizzle out, but we're starting to see some building southward now into the northeastern corner of Valverde County and even Edwards County. So that's good for you folks. And it's not out of the realm of, realm of possibility that we get further development southward here over the next hour or two before it completely rains itself out and dissipates. But taking a look at the, rate, the rainfall rates, we're looking at about three to four inches per hour within the heart of that downpour. So there's a look at that activity from earlier today. Over the past six hours came together near San Angelo, started to build southward and the blow off cloud cover from the, the anvil tops. That's what we saw today around sunset. And we'll take a look at our time limits, time lapse of that in a moment. First of all, the upper level wind flow is important here because we've got a thicker concentration of African dust over the Gulf and right along the coastline. That's going to get pushed in for tomorrow and for parts of Friday as well. So an extra haze in the air, particularly Thursday and a little bit on into Friday, then it really dissipates. I mentioned that nice anvil. Oh, look at that beautiful cloud. Isn't that nice from those distant storms? 97 was our high after a morning low of 80 degrees and 97, by the way, three degrees above average. Right now, by and large, we're in the 80s. Some locations hanging on to 90, especially Del Rio, 97. That's really the warm spot. Uh, 93 Carrizo Springs and Gonzales, you're at 84, but we're feeling the thick humidity. Look at these dew points well into the 70s. So very thick. Now, here's the thing. We are expecting these numbers to drop just a little bit in the coming days, especially by this weekend. And really all that's going to do is trim off a few degrees from our morning low temperatures at that point. Today, we didn't even drop into the 70s. Tomorrow, we're thinking upper 70s, about 78 at sunrise, low clouds to start the day, then a mixture of sun and clouds into the afternoon, humid, and that extra haze because of the African dust. But the dust is not gonna be as thick as what we had over the weekend. Well into the 90s tomorrow, right near 100 degrees by Friday and especially into the weekend. Our next chance of rain, it's a slight one, but it comes on Sunday and that's when we get into a pattern of some daily isolated pop-up rain chances. Thank you, Adam.
All right, some changes being recommended uh, for high school. Yes, athletes. and not just in San Antonio now, for the entire state of Texas. And this coming now from the UIL, now recommending shutdown of all summer strength camps. When we come back, more about that. And the NFL cuts at least two preseason games for every team. Coming up. The University Interscholastic League, which governs high schools in the state of Texas, is now recommending that all schools immediately suspend their summer strength and conditioning camps until July 13th. In anticipation of the July 4th holiday and the potential for increased social interactions that could spread the COVID-19. The recommendation also includes rehearsals, practices, and instruction between July 3rd and July 12th, resuming on Monday, July 13th. All the San Antonio school districts under the UIL have already done so, with Judson and Northeast announcing suspension of their camps on Sunday night. The city's law largest school district, Northside, and the San Antonio School District on Monday. And tonight, the Church Cibolo Universal City School District, where Athletic Director Scott Linhoff will close Steele and Clemens camps. Here is what the OIO said in their release in part. It said, for schools and areas experience community spread of COVID-19, this temporary suspension will reduce the risk of exposure and provide an opportunity to review current plans and reevaluate local context in order to make informed decisions moving forward. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Dallas Cowboys will be one of only two teams in the NFL to lose three preseason games before they plan kickoff of the 2020 season this September. The Cowboys and the Steelers have already lost their August 6 Hall of Fame game, postponed until next year due to the coronavirus. Now the league has mandated that all teams will give up preseason games one and four. The league feels this is for players' safety after many of the NFL stars have not been able to work out as much during this offseason due to the COVID-19 pandemic. For the Cowboys, that means they will not travel to Los Angeles to take on the Chargers on August the 16th. will also not travel to Houston for their annual rivalry against the Texans on September the 3rd. That means the Cowboys will not travel at all this preseason. For the Texans, besides losing their September 3rd home game against the Cowboys, they have also lost their preseason opener against the Vikings when they were set to travel to Minnesota on August the 14th. So the revised Cowboys schedule looks like this against Pittsburgh in the Hall of Fame game postponed. The Chargers canceled. Baltimore will be played in AT&T Stadium as well as Kansas City on the 29th and at Houston on the 3rd canceled. For the Texans, their revised schedule looks like this. Canceled against Minnesota for their preseason opener on Seattle. That'll be at home on August the 22nd at 7 p.m. Then they'll travel to New Orleans on the 29th and again against Dallas on September the 3rd canceled. Just how much the bubble environment will cost the NBA next. The restart of the NBA season in Orlando, Florida will cost the NBA more than $150 million. That's according to ESPN. It says that $150 million figure includes housing for 22 teams, their support staff at three different resorts, having to use seven practice courts, no less than three arenas to resume the season under quarantine. It also includes the cost of meals, daily uh, coronavirus tests, medical support, security, transportation, and entertainment. That's part of the projected loss of $1 billion in revenue due to the coronavirus, but trying to save just under a billion dollars in TV revenue by staging the reopening. Our San Antonio Spurs are set to depart for Orlando, Florida, just over one week from today to help restart that NBA season. But NBA Commissioner Adam Silver admits there is no guarantee that's going to happen now. Three positive coronavirus tests had shut down the Never Nuggets facility and the alarming increase of COVID-19 positive tests in the state of Florida, where the reopening will be held at the wide world of sports complex at Disney World. Has the commissioner concern? Remember, it was only one positive test, Rudy Gobert, that shut down the NBA season in March, and all the other major sports followed quickly. Speaking with Time 100, the commissioner says at this point, he is still confident in the bubble environment the league has created to protect players, coaches, and staff. If cases are isolated, that's one thing. I think a lot of the determination will be our understanding of how our community became infected. I'm absolutely convinced it will be safer on this campus than off this campus because there aren't many other situations I'm aware of where there's mass testing of asymptomatic employees. I mean, so in some ways, this is maybe a model for other how other industries can ultimately open. The Spurs are set to open their eight-game restart on July 31st against the Sacramento Kings at 7 p.m. Age alone will not prevent NBA coaches from traveling to Orlando for the restart of the NBA season. That's according to the league's office. They told the NBA's Coaches Association that individuals at high risk for the coronavirus will not go but simply being, because of simply being older without other risk will not place them in that category. That's good news for Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, who is 71 years old, and according for the 
Center for Disease Control and Prevention is in that age bracket that is more susceptible to COVID-19. Officials of the Alamo City Golf Trail courses have alerted golfers that beginning tomorrow, new guidelines go into effect after both Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf issued new orders for safety requirements for businesses. You will have to undergo a temperature check and answer pre-screening symptom questions before being allowed to play. So you're up to speed on that. And the Flying Chonclas, by the way, tonight in Amarillo dropped their second game in a row, but a lot closer tonight. one nothing. Their home opener is at the Wolf this Friday at 7. All right. Thank you, Greg. You got it. The measures now revamped as we try and slow the spread of COVID-19. A live KSAT Q&A with Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Up next. We take our questions and your questions to local experts and get them answered. That's the purpose behind KSAT Q&A. And we are pleased that on Wednesday nights, uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg joins us. And uh, Mayor, thank you for joining us. And, and we talked at six about uh, why you made the decision to change uh, some of the requirements for businesses. And may maybe let's hit on that real quick again here at 10. Sure, the objective remains the same is that we want to make sure that we're limiting uh, the exposure of people who may be infected to the general public and thereby in, you know, spreading the infection and increasing transmission. So the objective remains the same, but as we work through, through various businesses uh, about the practicability of checking temperatures at the door, not all businesses would be able to con conduct that effectively in the short term. So we looked at uh, the data um, and what would be most effective, and that is making sure everybody clearly sees what the symptomatology of COVID is when they walk in, and if they have it, they can't come in. So a posting requirement for the symptoms, and then, of course, highly encouraging uh, all businesses to take temperatures, but not mandatory for all of them. I want to get back to those orders in just a minute, but first I want to ask you a little bit about our hospital capacity. During this briefing, you have said that we are increasing at a rate of 10% every day. To your knowledge, where do we stand today and where are we headed here in the next few weeks? Well, uh, as of today, we had about 27% capacity in staffed hospital beds. Uh, that is concerning for a couple of reasons. Number one, we've been increasing capacity by adding staff, adding nurses, bringing in nurses from other parts of the country, as well as limiting elective surgeries. And as we've increased capacity in the hospital system, it's quickly being taken up by COVID-19 patients, as well as other uh, reasons that people go to the hospital, trauma, heart attacks, pregnancies, all those other things. Uh, so the hospital capacity is being uh, taken as quickly as it's coming online, and that's not a sustainable trend. Uh, of course, we have surge management protocols that they're going through right now. Ultimately, we have an alternative care uh, facility available at Freeman Coliseum, but even that is not an infinite resource. So at the trend that we're going on right now, if there's no abating this uh, increase and acceleration of cases in the hospital, we're gonna run out of capacity. So that is why the situation is so dire. That is why we're asking people to stay home uh, and do everything they can to limit the spread of this infection and, and keep themselves from getting sick. If you could, would you issue a stay home work safe order right now? You know, I really wouldn't uh, because the power to control this infection is in our hands. If we can't uh, if we can't do what the doctors and the uh, health professionals are telling us, uh, we'll ultimately control this infection. Physical distancing, wearing a face mask, personal hygiene, all those things that we are going to have to do regardless of whether we're staying home or and only doing essential activities out and about or we're, we're you know, operating as we are now. Um, that's ultimately going to is going to be what controls this infection. If you talk to the public health professionals, they are very clear. It is it is making sure we're adhering to the public health guidance, and that is what's not happening right now. As we've seen these mixed messages, and we've seen the 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 very quick opening of um, businesses and other operations. Um, but you know, we have to focus again on all the things that the public health professionals have been telling us to do from the very start. That is ultimately what's going to curb this uh, infection rate and and ultimately make sure that we have capacity in our hospitals to treat those who are ill. If this continues to go, we're going to be forced to take measures that we really don't want to take, however. 
I, I want to ask you really quickly about testing. Where are we in terms of testing? I know that we've spoken to a lot of folks who are having trouble finding a test. Where, where are we right now in terms of being able to, to, to test people on a mass scale? Uh, we have roughly, uh, in public and private providers, roughly 6,000 tests uh, available on any given day here in San Antonio, going through the labs, et cetera. Uh, labs, uh, tests are available uh, through walk-up sites. They're available through private labs and private providers. They're available through some of the hospitals. So they're widely available, and they don't require an appointment. They don't require uh, a doctor's order or insurance or even money to take them. Uh, we need to make sure, though, that people are able to um, get the information and, and, and get to the test. So that's really what the challenge is. I think uh, today we reported some somewhere in the range of 4,000 tests taken. We're not getting to our capacity yet. So we have tests available. We need to make sure that people are getting them. Well, you talked about some of the measures that you don't want to take. I mean, what is the next step? I mean, is there an end where we're like, you know, we have to start turning people away from emergency rooms, uh, you know, for things that they would normally be seen for there. Uh, we don't want to get there. And that's what we're watching. And, and so this conversation about, you know, do we need to start closing things up again is one that I'm having hourly with our medical experts, our public health professionals. And, 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 and we're, they're going to be very clear. I've asked them to give me, again, the plain truth their recommendations of what we ought to do. And, and they're very clear right now. You know, the, the consequences of us having to close things up again, uh, psychologically to, you know, our ability to, to put food on the table, which, all, which also is critical, um, is, is very damaging. And so we want to do everything we can to avoid that uh, choice, uh, avoid that circumstance. And, and right now, we are in a red zone, and, and we have the ability to turn this infection back. We've instituted the mask order. We've tightened up some of the protocols with regard to health uh, precautions. We're closing some things, such as the, the parks over, uh, over the holiday weekend to make sure that we're limiting congregation, congregating of people. We've got to do all those things up to the point where if that's not working, then we are going to have to close things up again, but we don't want to get to that point. This is an hourly ongoing conversation. We're looking at those numbers every single day, every single hour. Um, I, believe me, tomorrow morning, the first thing I'm going to be asking about is our hospital numbers. And so that's, you know, th that that's where we are. We're in the red zone and, and a lot rides on the next few days and how we respond to that. Mayor Ron Nuremberg joining us live. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, guys. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. In the days leading up to the 4th of July, 40% of the country has either stopped or backtracked on reopening plans. As cases rise, scientists are racing against the clock to develop a vaccine. ABC's Zareen Shah reports. Much of America taking a step back or halting reopening plans ahead of Independence Day, including California, which reported nearly 10,000 new cases on Wednesday. Its governor placing new restrictions on bars, restaurants and movie theaters in 19 counties. The bottom line is the spread of this virus continues uh, at a rate that is particularly concerning. New York's mayor also stopping plans to move forward to allow indoor dining. Even a week ago, Honestly, I was hopeful we could, but the news we have gotten from around the country gets worse and worse all the time. Getting worse throughout the country, including Arizona, with another record jump. Vice President Pence, seen wearing a mask, arrived in Phoenix on Wednesday. Parts of the country getting on board to make those masks mandatory, including Miami-Dade County, where facial coverings will be required in all public spaces. A Miami nurse saying patients she's seeing are more critical than before. If things don't change and people don't take it a little more serious in the next two weeks, you know, who knows where we will be. But there are positive signs for a vaccine in the next year. Pfizer just announced strong results from initial phase one and two trials, indicating they could move on to their next phase with 30,000 volunteers in coming weeks. Oxford's trials are in phase three. If their vaccine is found to be safe and effective, they could have emergency doses of the vaccine ready as early as October. Moderna also about to embark on phase three of trials. 
But the president on Fox Business Wednesday with a slightly different perspective on how the virus will be controlled. And I think we're going to be very good with the coronavirus. I think that at some point uh, that's going to sort of just disappear, I hope. You still believe so? Disappear? Well, I do. I do. Yeah, sure. At some point. Right now, this virus is here to stay. Hospitalizations up in 25 states, deaths up in 14. So many leaders just bracing for the 4th of July, hoping that folks follow guidelines. Zorin Shaw, ABC News, Los Angeles. Take a live look outside with live Canberra hazy day. Very muggy day too, Adam. Oh, that humidity is yes. in full swing. It sure is. It's in a full July mode. The humidity with dew points well into the 70s yet again and a little thunderstorm sneaking its way into parts of the northern hill country. Now, every once in a while we get that activity around uh, around San Angelo and even Midland. Sometimes it drifts our way and we get some of the remnants and that's what we're seeing right now. So this is good. Count your lucky stars. Take a look at the radar screen and what we have going on and you notice that one cluster that one heavy downpour, that thunderstorm, and a little bit of southward development even into Valverde County. That's what we're watching, and this is likely to continue its trek southward into Edwards County, likely Real County, but I do think the most likely scenario is that a lot of it would really fall apart by the time it would make it down toward Highway 90 into Uvalde County and Kinney County. Either way, this is some good rainfall for a few folks, especially in Sutton County. I mean, right now the rainfall rates are on the order of two to three and a half inches per hour and six hour rainfall totals are pretty impressive where the rain really was coming down hard. Nearly four inches just east of Sonora, two and a half north of Sonora, one and a half just south of Sonora. So good soaking rain within it and luckily nothing severe. Again, I do think the most likely scenario is that we'll still see some of this activity just over the next hour or two push southward make it into more of Edwards, Real counties, and then start to fall apart into Kinney and Uvalde counties with some of that development westward into Valverde County that we're seeing start kind of stretching westward there. All right, here's the radar over the past six hours. San Angelo, there it was, then it starts to drift southward. We're going to probably see this again tomorrow, where if we're lucky, we'll get clipped by some of that leftover activity. Otherwise, upper level high, that's going to be sliding overhead over the next few days, and I think it's really going to limit our thunderstorm potential. Whereas once that high moves far west of us by Sunday, we could actually see if you pop up showers. The upper level winds are important because it's going to give us another hit of that African dust in our sky tomorrow, and it will start to dissipate out as we get into Friday and especially the weekend. Nonetheless, if you're sensitive to the dust, I think tomorrow is going to be the worst day of the next seven. 86 right now. Ooh, look at that dew point. Oh yeah, muggy 75 degree dew point. So it feels like it's 95 right now. See Ozona at 72, some rain cooled air there. And you get elsewhere, we're mostly in the 80s. Some locations still hanging on to some 90s, especially Del Rio right now, the real hot spot at 97. Here it is, those are dew points well into the 70s. It is that sticky air. We'll only see minor changes in the humidity the next few days. Low clouds tomorrow. Can't rule out a little sprinkle or two that often happens with those low clouds. Then a mixture of sun and clouds, partly cloudy into the afternoon. 97 for the high temperature, and it's one of those days where CPS likes to encourage everybody between 3 and 6 p.m. especially to reduce your energy use. You can particularly avoid the kitchen and go outside and grill in the afternoon to get uh, dinner ready. That's a good way to uh, reduce your energy use and avoid the appliances. Into the weekend, a lot of folks are grilling. It's going to be hot though. Fourth of July, sunny. Oh, we'll be right near 100 degrees. Oh yeah. Weekend. You know, the, it, CPS Energy does an interesting thing where they send out like a competition among your neighbors. Yes, absolutely. Like 100 really? homes, and you uh -huh. see where you rank. Yeah. I've never. And, and seen tomorrow's that. one of those days uh -huh. where they're going to see how you rank for energy efficiency compared to the, your neighbors. Do you have to sign up for this? I don't I know what so. I, I, I think so. Yeah, I've, I've never heard. I, 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 I'm a competitive guy, okay. so I'm like, <laughs> okay, I know what I was last but, time. Let's see what it is this time. But some people have solar. That's true, yeah. and it throws it off. In my, but opinion. it's still, you know. That means I'm going to have to get solar. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. The COVID-19 pandemic has been dominating headlines since mid-March when the first case was confirmed in our community. And while everyone has felt the effects, it has become increasingly clear some have been hit much harder than others. Yeah, from the digital divide to access to health care, the impact of this pandemic 
has been uneven in our city. That is the topic of the next episode of KSAT Explains that will be out tomorrow on all of our digital platforms. Tonight we're giving you a preview. Myra Arthur explains how the focus is on equity. I think equity has become a buzzword as quickly as it's gained any sort of critical mileage. Kieran Cower Baines was the first chief equity officer for the city of San Antonio, so she's familiar with the concept. But what does equity really mean? It's being able to deliver services and programs accounting for the different needs and challenges of every citizen. In this way, equity is different from equality um, in that it doesn't mean sameness. Using what's called an equity lens, our local government would not distribute resources to each of our 10 city council districts evenly. It would actually mean we're accounting for how needs look very different across the community when it comes to specific areas um, of work, whether that's transportation or education or family well-being. So, for example, if the city sets aside part of its budget for street repairs, the council districts with the most streets to repair would get the largest share of that budget. Mayor Ron Nirenberg says San Antonio was actually the first big city in the country to use an equity lens and framework when allocating resources back in 2017. We are by no means even close um, to uh, restoring the levels of equity that would be required for us to have a resilient city. But we have taken the first significant steps before this pandemic and the pandemic has illustrated why we need to continue to, to, to march in that direction. KSAT explains the uneven impact of COVID-19 will be available to watch on demand starting tomorrow on KSAT.com and on the KSAT TV app. That's available on your Roku, Fire Stick, or most other smart TV devices. Still ahead, a local nonprofit proving a service to help keep small businesses afloat amid the pandemic. We're going to head to the south side to get a look at how it all works. And the demand for change being heard in Delaware, the shift towards a new future coming up. And several city council members in Ohio facing bribery charges. The question one councilman had for investigators in this case. Next on the Night Beat. Around America tonight, four council members accused of working the system in Toledo, Ohio. The FBI announced bribery charges against the three men and one woman. They allegedly traded favors and money from local businesses for favorable votes in council chambers. One councilman, Gary Johnson, denied taking any bribes and questioned if investigators knew the difference between a bribe or a campaign contribution. Toledo's mayor called this a terrible day for Toledo, but said the four should be presumed innocent until proven otherwise. A whipping post that was on display in Georgetown, Delaware, now removed. Throughout the state, whipping was disproportionately used as a punishment against blacks. The last public punishment of the sort was in 1952. State officials say the removal is, quote, in recognition of the violence and racial discrimination that its display represents, end quote. Many in the community were in agreement of the change. Today is, it's about all of us coming together to make a better world. The post belongs to the state's Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. This whipping post was installed outside the old Sussex County Courthouse in 1993 and will now be put into storage. State historical experts say its removal is long overdue. Hundreds of people lined up in Oklahoma City today to get unemployment benefits claims resolved amid the pandemic. The Oklahoma Employment Security Commission is hosting in-person, socially distanced claim processing events over multiple days. Some Oklahoma residents have waited months to get any unemployment relief. People in line said they are desperate for any help they can get. Well, here at home, Maestro Entrepreneur Center's name is its mission. It teaches owners how to grow their businesses and encourages residents to buy local. Tonight, Jesse De Goyado tells us about two small business owners who came to the Southside nonprofit and are now trying to weather tough times. Teresa Garcia is one determined small business owner. Giving up is not an option. Quitting is not an option. Especially since her rent is low and her utilities are covered here at the Maestro Entrepreneur Center. That's also given her the training she needed. They have been instrumental in my surviving this pandemic. 
She had to. Her business, she says, is essential. Right now, her classes on food handling safety required by state and local health departments are in demand. Because a lot of uh, restaurants are finding out that their certificates are expired. Then there's this specialty craft cold brew coffee now on grocery shelves. It went from being produced in a dorm room at Trinity to the on-site kitchen here at the Maestro Center. So they were a blessing to us, giving us the opportunity to actually produce like a real manufacturer and to be a real brand. Being on the South Side, the nonprofit even offers its help in two languages. It's completely for free. There are many resources. Use it to your advantage. Jesse De Gullado, KSAT 12 News. Hey, coming up, he's not exactly on the big screen, but he's making an appearance in the Big Apple, the new campaign that's using a slasher film for its inspiration. Next. More communities are ramping up testing to try and target and contain COVID-19. In Guadalupe County, there will be a free COVID-19 testing site open on Friday. The mobile site will be available from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Max Starkey Park in Seguin. Our web team is also updating testing sites for the San Antonio area online at KSAT.com. All right, check this out. New York State turning to humor to try to get people to keep wearing masks during the pandemic. This 32nd PSA stars a character who looks suspiciously like Jason from the Friday the 13th slasher horror films. He's walking around the streets of New York City in his hockey mask and he finds out because he's not wearing a protective mask, people are afraid of him. See, there you go. The tagline reads, wearing a mask can be scary, not wearing one can be deadly. Very creative. Yes. That's it for the night. Don't forget, Good Morning San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.